Oh, I'm looking forward to Survivor Series, I said. Oh, I appreciate them going back to more of a traditional Survivor Series format, I said. Oh, I'm glad they've got multiple tag matches on this show, I said. I'm glad neither one of the world titles and neither one of the women's titles is being defended here. You get a break from the titles always being defended, I said. Me and my big fucking mouth. I knew I was going to be in for a long, mostly disappointing night about halfway through the opening women's tag match. You start off and Nikki Bella's getting taken out and here comes Natalia. Who gives a fuck? This was done for no reason and no purpose of any storyline consequence whatsoever. Then you look at the two teams and you've got the two women's champions, Charlotte, Becky Lynch. They have story going back to wrestling for the women's title along with Sasha Banks at WrestleMania 32. They're in this match. The way you used to do it is you would build that up as something big. You would have these two champions have a stare down. You would give them some shine together. You would do something with them. And instead, the WWE did nothing. This was just one botchy, sloppy fuck fest. And the one redeeming quality of this match was Nia Jax. She was the unquestionable, unequivocal star of this match. She was a beast. She was dominant. And they were doing so many good things with her. And then they had their monster tap out. This is why the WWE doesn't make stars. Because they intentionally sabotage their characters with stupid shit like this. If you're going to have Nia Jax not go over, if you're not going to have her be one of the survivors... Then you have her get counted out. You have her get disqualified. You have her leave. You do any number of freaking things. You don't sit there and have your monster tap out. As soon as that happened, I was done with this fucking match because that was fucking ridiculous. And it was just the beginning of a night of questionable booking decisions. Now, once The Miz beat the suspect sissy on SmackDown this past week and won the IC title... I lost my built-in designated piss-slash-shit break for this pay-per-view. But I can overlook that. I made it up later in the night, believe me. Um, because this match between Sami Zayn and Miz was a bit of a hidden gem on this card. It really was. It was one of the few real highlights. The Miz is outstanding right now. This is as good as I've ever seen The Miz. He really is at the top of his game. And frankly, he's one of the best performers in the WWE and in the business period right now. And if you don't agree with me, I don't care. You know, Sami Zayn is boring as piss, as I like to call Sami Zayn. He's zero sell. And before you idiots sit there with your flaming keyboard fingers of fire and be like, he sells all the time, he sells magnificently. No, it's inconsistent and stupid if and when he actually does. You can't sit there and get your knee hurt. And then you're running like absolutely nothing is fucking wrong until after you pull off a series of spots. Then all of a sudden you want to act like your knee is fucking hurting you again. It makes absolutely no sense and it hurts the credibility of your fucking matches. While The Miz is sitting there and actually trying to be a character and actually trying to sell a story, Sami Zayn still wants to work like he's fucking wrestling in ROH. Learn how to wrestle a big league style. And for all you fans, stop, stop, please stop kissing this motherfucker's ass. Because this product will not get any better until you stop kissing the ass of these vanilla fucking performers like Sami Zayn. It's not vanilla midgets because there are big dudes in this company we all know that are fucking vanilla as hell too. And can't work to save their fucking life. Sami Zayn can't work. Period. And I'm tired of people telling me that he does. The one good thing they did in all of this though. You have Maurice there. She's the built-in heater. So you use the built-in heater. Now nobody in their right mind would believe that Sami Zayn would have any sexual interest in Maurice whatsoever. Whatsoever. If she was maybe a video game console or some nerdy anime crap, then perhaps you would buy it and believe it. But a woman trying to curry any type of sexual favor from him? <laughs> Sami Zayn doesn't have time for that. He wants to pal around with Kevin Owens. So the way they interjected Maurice into this, I thought was very clever, and I thought it made perfect sense. It was an old-school finish that made sense, and in a night of wishy-washy, crappy booking, this was one of the few things 
that really connected, clicked, and worked for me. I thought these two had a good match and did what they were supposed to do on the show. Now, for as bad as I thought the women's five-on-five -five match was, I could make a strong argument that the 10-on-10 -on -10 tag team Survivor Series match was even worse. This was a steaming pile of shit sandwiched right in the middle of this shit sandwich of a show. Let me get this straight. You have your two brands tag team champions, and similar to the women's match, you do absolutely nothing with them in the ring together. Furthermore, not only do you not do really anything with them together and build this up to be any type of appealing attraction whatsoever or do anything interesting with it, we eliminate the New Day just like that. The guys who are very close to breaking Demolition's record for the longest reigning WWF slash E tag team champions of all time, we've sat there and jobbed them out in no time flat. So instead of using this match as a chance to maybe spotlight a Big E or perhaps really cement some type of tension festering under the surface between Big E and the rest of the New Day, we just eliminate them just like that. Like they don't even fucking matter. We spend more time focusing on the stupid Usos than we do the Raw Tag Team Champions or the SmackDown Tag Team Champions. This match went on for way too fucking long. Way too fucking long. If you were going to cash out the New Day like you did, you should have at least had um, Enzo Amore and Colin Cassidy go all the way to the end. Amore and Big Cash should have went to the end. And of course they fucking didn't, because this company is fucking stupid. We finally get to what breaks out to be, you know, a regular tag team match, because it went on for too goddamn long between Sheamus and Cesaro and the Usos, and by this point in time, I'm completely fucking checked out. I'm like, ta ta today, Junior. The only thing the WWE got right with this at the end of the day was they had the right team finish, but this match was so fucking bad. You know, this should have been a great spotlight for tag team wrestling in the WWE. And instead, it became a shit show for all the things wrong with the WWE's current creative process. This match was horrible. You take the New Day and you eliminate them immediately. You treat your SmackDown tag team champions, Rhino and Heath Slater, like they're second class citizens. Who books this shit? Now, a little while back, I did a video talking about how the... Raw brand having a cruiserweight division was a stupid idea. And I outlined the reasons why it was a stupid idea. And as is so often the case, many came and bitched at me and pissed and moaned and told me how I was wrong. And I just sit back and wait to be proven right. And it's like the cycle repeats itself time after time. Lo and behold, the Schleg Daddy was right. Of course, people won't admit that and will come up with excuses. doesn't matter your excuses at the end of the day. I was right. Now, with that said, this Cruiserweight title match, you know, once I realized who was actually going to be involved, it had my interest just a little bit. Brian Kendrick, is, to me, is a real pleasure to watch. He's actually one of the best pure performers that the WWE has. And I wish I did a little bit more to spotlight him and feature him because, frankly, he deserves it. He's actually really good at his job. And the promo they were showing of him, that pre-taped promo before the match, I thought was outstanding stuff. And even for Callisto, you know, there's at least a little name recognition there, a multiple-time United States champion. And he most certainly is far more interesting than anything that TJ Dumdick could ever hope to fucking be. And it's fascinating to me, when you put him on the pay-per-view and you actually allow them to do some cruiserweight stuff... You can get a match where there are spots and the type of high-flying, high-impact shit you expect out of the Cruiserweight division, but you can still manage to tell a story, and a part that comes with the genius of Brian Kendrick actually calling the match. So I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay, the two tag matches have been crappy so far, but the IC title match I was okay with, and I'm getting to the point where I'm really okay with this Cruiserweight title match. The show might not be a complete epic fucking loss. And then the finish happened. And how appropriate for the WWE to take something and screw it up. Now, it's bad enough up to this point in time in the card. Team SmackDown had already lost the women's match. They had already lost the tag team match. Now here's a chance to, storyline-wise, do the right thing and get the Cruiserweight division on SmackDown where the fuck it deserves to be, where the fuck it belongs, and where the hell it's needed. 
and you sit there and throw that all away so you could have Baron Corbin run in and fuck up Kendrick and Callisto. Why? So that way him and Callisto could have a crappy feud that nobody's going to give a shit about? Here was a chance to do something really good and let this match stand on its own and be a real statement piece for the Cruiserweight division, a division that really, really needs it, especially when you're trying to launch that 205 Live show on the goddamn WWE Network. And instead you threw it all away for Baron Corbin, who, correct me if I'm wrong, speaking of a lack of continuity and who writes and who books this shit, wasn't Baron Corbin injured and as a result he couldn't be on Team SmackDown and that's why Shane McMahon ultimately had to take his place, but yet he's running out here and he's fucking up and ending this Cruiserweight title match? Again, who books this shit? Because this was a real letdown, because you were actually building up to something pretty good the only positive out of it is that Brian Kendrick is still the Cruiserweight Champion, and that's a good thing. My biggest disappointment with this year's Survivor Series was not the booking. As bad and atrocious as it was, I've come to expect that out of this company. This company right now couldn't book its way out of a paper bag. So that's the expectation. I've come to expect it. So it's hard to be disappointed by it. You know, it sucks, but... It's not the most disappointing thing. The most disappointing thing to me, actually, about the show was that each of the three traditional Survivor Series matches sucked. And I'm not falling for the tricks and the bullshit that they tried with this Raw versus SmackDown match. You ultimately had two of your most popular characters in Kevin Owens and Chris Jericho get eliminated because of a list. Think about that. Eliminated because of a list. You're trying to fool us with a shield pop, whoop-de-doo, but it still doesn't get over the fact that we're still barking up the tree of a fucking AJ Styles, Dean Ambrose feud. Give me a fucking break. And while a lot of people might sit there and say, at least Roman Reigns wasn't the sole survivor, it would have been more fitting on this show if he actually was. You know, it's okay that Bray Wyatt and Randy Orton go over here. It'd be nice if Randy Orton was going to be a part of the Wyatt family, if he actually looked like a part of the Wyatt family. Um, and Bray Wyatt getting a big win at a Big Four pay-per-view is, is fine, but it's too fucking late to do anything about it. And again, because the show was so long and you had so few matches, naturally these matches were going to be long. And once again, this match to me was clearly a victim of having way, way too much fucking time to fill. When I'm halfway through a match and I'm already begging for this shit to fucking be over, that's not good. And you're not going to fucking fool me with the cheap shield pop. That's not enough to get the job done. Yeah, Shane McMahon took a brutal spot, looked like him and Roman both kind of legitimately hurt themselves, but it doesn't mask the fact that he throws some of the most ridiculous looking working punches that I've ever fucking seen. This match was bad. At least SmackDown won something on this fucking night, but this was just like the perfect cap on the traditional Survivor Series matches. They all sucked, and if anything, as bad as a woman's match was, I thought the 10 on 10 tag team match was worse, to only be surpassed by the Raw vs. SmackDown match, in large part because of the length and the fact that we have two people getting eliminated over a fucking list, and it's just, give me a fucking break. Up to this point in time in the night, I was ready to rank this as one of the worst Survivor Series of all time, and it was still really, really bad. And maybe it cracks the top five or top seven list for the worst, because this show was shitty. And my heart really went out to the people of Toronto at this point in time, before we got to the main event, as I said, my God, can you imagine what these people paid for prices for tickets, especially if they got that big VIP package and they got the NXT show and then they got Survivor Series and Raw and SmackDown? I'm sitting there saying to myself, I'm glad I'm not one of those fools that paid all that money for this shit. And then the main event happened. And if a lot of those fans didn't feel gypped already, you get Goldberg, Brock Lesnar, a match straight out of the video game, 12 and a half years in the making, and it lasts a minute and 26 seconds. So anybody that was actually there live, if they felt like they were gypped at this point in time, especially after the main event, and how quick it was after this shitstorm of a night, I can't blame them. I'm not going to argue with them, because if I was there, I would feel the same damn way.
Now, I had argued before that Goldberg needed to go over Brock Lesnar for a plethora of reasons. But I didn't expect it to come this way. And I have to say, I was shocked. And I was surprised. And I was pleased as fucking punch with what the WWE did here. Now, hear me out. To me, this worked on so many different levels. First, from the Goldberg perspective. You're bringing Goldberg back. He hasn't worked in a WWE ring in 12 and a half years. Especially knowing that you're going to do something with him at the Royal Rumble and WrestleMania. You want to get the most that you can out of the Goldberg turnip. So what better way to do that than establish him in a strong, strong, serious, legitimate, viable way than having him beat the beast incarnate Brock Lesnar? Now, when you've got Goldberg coming out on Raw and talking about that he's got one more title shot in him and we'll see him at the Royal Rumble, even though the smarter of us fans know where this is going and know what this is building to, you still find yourself taking him much more seriously than you would have if he would have lost at Survivor Series. Why the hell would you put him in the Royal Rumble if he came back after 12 and a half years and he lost? Now Goldberg wins. Furthermore, knowing going into this that Brock works a slow kind of plotting style that frankly isn't very good and Goldberg has never been an in-ring maestro. Did you really want to run the risk of having this match be booed out of the building at the end of this really shitty night, you know, and have it turn out to be a WrestleMania 20 type of situation all over again? If you don't need to go with the long match, don't go there. And sometimes for me, when you've built up a heel to a certain point, it's best to have them lose quickly. And in this particular match, because the match was so short and Goldberg came out so strong and so powerful from basically the jump until the end, Lester worked as the default heel, even though he's one of the top baby faces in the company. And when you've got a monster like this, the best way to have them lose from a storyline and character standpoint is to hurry up and get it done and get it out of the fucking way. Don't have them get beat up for 10, 15, 20 minutes. You could sit there now and sell this as Brock took him lightly and he didn't take it seriously and he got caught with his Jimmy John shorts down. It works. I mean, seriously, this is by far the most interesting thing that Brock Lesnar has done since SummerSlam 2014 when he decimated John Cena. Easily, not even close, the most interesting thing he has done in over two years. Now, I'm a lot more invested in what Brock Lesnar is going to do on the road to WrestleMania than I would have been otherwise if he had just come in here and beat Goldberg. Yes, he built up Lesnar to this point. And I talked a little bit about the fact it didn't make much sense for Brock Lesnar to end the streak just to have Undertaker beat him once in questionable circumstances. And then Goldberg, a guy that's been gone for 12 and a half years, comes back and beat him. What the fuck does that say about the rest of the roster? Well, you know what? Fuck the rest of the roster. It's a bunch of ham and egg jabronis and mid-carters masquerading as main eventers. The company doesn't care about their fucking main roster. Well, you got to have somebody beat Brock Lesnar at some point in time. Otherwise, he becomes the wrong type of attraction and you get a diminishing return. And that's what was happening. It's one of these situations where I can be happy about it now and maybe bitch about it later. But right now, I'm ecstatic about this. It was legitimately a surprise. It was a shocking moment. And it was great to see Goldberg get over in this way to where you avoided having the Toronto crowd potentially turn on him the longer the match goes, or if he slipped or he looked bad, you avoid all of that shit. You have Goldberg accentuate the positives and you mask the negatives. And with Brock Lesnar, now you've set him up as an angry beast, an angry conqueror, an angry monster who's going to come out looking for blood. You could set up to a real big bloodbath type of style match between these two at WrestleMania 33, if that's the direction that you choose to go. No matter what, though, this was the best possible outcome. If Lesnar beats Goldberg, it's business as usual, same old shit. Lesnar gets nothing from it, and Goldberg gets nothing from it. On the flip side, by not only having Goldberg go over, in my opinion, does Goldberg get something out of it, maybe even more importantly, Brock Lesnar gets something more out of it, and perhaps even more out of Goldberg, because while you're establishing Goldberg, and you're bringing another star into the fold, 
come WrestleMania season and you're getting some really nice white hot type of heat on him, it's Brock Lesnar where the story is. It's Brock Lesnar who's demonstrated a little chink in the armor. It's Brock Lesnar now that you wonder what the hell is going to happen next. So we could sit there and complain about, you know, what this does for the fucking main roster and the full-timers that are there and all of this and all of that. But at the end of the day, this was the right moment in time to do something. And the WWE did it in a night full of screw-ups and fuck-ups. This was the best thing that this company did. Not every match needs to go 40 minutes. And most certainly not every big featured main attraction match needs to go 20 or 30 minutes. Sometimes the best way to get your message across, the best way to accomplish many positive things, is keep it short and sweet as you possibly can. And that's what the WWE he did here. And I applaud him for it. What a fucking moment. It was clearly awesome. I know the Brock Lesnar fanboys are butthurt right now, but shut the fuck up. Y'all have gotten your way the past couple of years and it's been boring as piss. Let's do it this way and watch how much more entertaining it will actually be. Survivor Series 2016 is what the WWE is and what they're about. You get a lot of shit and then they try to give you that one big spectacular moment to try and pull the wool over your eyes and mask the smell of the other shit and leave you liking the taste of it and wanting more, more, more. This show in a lot of ways reminded me of Survivor Series 2014, where you really frankly had a crappy show, and then Sting appears, and he takes out Triple H, and it's fucking awesome. And you forget about the rest of the crap that happened on the show, and you just remember this is when Sting came to the WWE finally, and it's an awesome moment, and you're off to the races with him and Hunter at WrestleMania 31. In a lot of ways, that's what this show reminded me of. You know, I thought the IC title match was decent. The Cruiserweight title match had potential and ended up with an incredibly disappointing, lame-ass, stupid finish. All three of the traditional Survivor Series matches were terrible. And in fact, they only got worse as the night went along. And really what you got was that one real, true, memorable, shocking moment where Goldberg destroyed Brock Lesnar in no time flat. That's what the WWE does. And every once in a while they can get away with it. I'm tired of them using that as a surviving type of business model for their pay-per-view business and for their product as a whole. But this is the WWE we get today. It still doesn't change the fact that this was a shitty show. I just have a good feeling about it with the way it fucking finished.